Good morning and welcome to Southern Hills United Methodist Church Online Worship. We are so glad that you have uh, decided to, to log in this morning and join us for worship. If you don't know who I am, I'm Jim Nichols and I get to be the pastor here. And it truly is, in a kind of a weird way, a joy to welcome you this morning as we've gathered today. I want to share a couple of things with you as we begin. First off, I want to say thank you for all of the encouraging notes and messages that you have been sending to me and to our staff. Um, This online thing is different and it's new for us. And so we're trying uh, a lot of different ways in which that, in in ways in which we can connect and we can stay together. Uh, This morning, you're going to see a couple different changes as we continue to adapt and we continue to, uh, to make room for the, uh, the coronavirus, you'll see notice behind us that our chancel, behind me that our chancel is uh, laid out a little bit differently. We're going to be using different uh, angles with our cameras this morning as well uh, so that we can uh, really take advantage of the, uh, of the opportunity uh, to show just how we're trying to adapt with you. Continue to be patient with us though because there is a lot of stuff that we're continuing to learn. Um, we do want to also invite you to go to the website, to the Daily Bread page, and you can download this morning's order of worship. It'll be right there. That way you can follow along with us this morning. Uh, all of the words for our service today will be on the screen, uh, but that way you know it's going to be coming. Uh, we're also going to be offering this morning a, an opportunity to, uh, to take our tithes and offerings. Many of you responded last week, and uh, you took us up on the, the giving digitally. Many of you also have been sending in your checks throughout this week. We're deeply thankful. Uh, But we're going to be having that opportunity this morning as well. Uh, Following this service, from 1 until 3 o'clock, there'll be an opportunity uh, right outside uh, where our canopy is for you to drive in if you want to bring a a check or an offering of cash any way that you want to. There'll be buckets there that you can just roll the window down and drop it out. There'll be people there who'll be able to to, uh, to collect those. And uh, they'll all be hand sanitized, we promise and a little bit further than six feet away. Uh, we also want to thank this morning uh, Janelle Hamilton, who is, uh, the, uh, been, uh, is going to be leading us in our, our, our accompanist and uh, our piano playing this morning. She's doing that for us this morning because uh, as we talked throughout the week, uh, we realized that, uh, that James and Kelly, as they work in a hospital in the midst of this uh, pandemic, uh, they wanted to be uh, and share extra caution. Uh, even on a video. They wanted to distance themselves. They are not sick, but we want to continue to be praying for them. And we're so thankful that Janelle has decided to be with us this morning and, uh, and to lead with us. Um, finally, one thing that we're excited to share with you is we're going to be working and sharing uh, online in the, in the days to come an opportunity for us during Holy Week. It's right around the corner to be able to come into the sanctuary in small groups. There'll be a sign-up sheet for you to do that, to come in to take communion, to take that opportunity to, uh, to spend this Holy Week and begin this Holy Week and season uh, in the right way uh, around the Lord's table. So we'll be doing that uh, as safely as we can. We'll have a sign-up sheet, and you'll see more about that coming up in our emails and on the website. So again, friends, thanks for being with us this morning. Let's worship the Lord with all of our heart, with all of our soul, and with all of our might. Amen? Amen. gospel lesson, 
we will hear the familiar and passionate story of a woman, a very broken woman, who anointed Jesus' feet with a costly perfume. Her gift was lavish. Her love for Jesus was extravagant. Today, as we contemplate this story, our liturgy has the imagery of God's love being poured out on each of us. For God loves us unconditionally, and the lavish gift of love that we receive is through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. invited to stand as you are able right where you are for our call to worship and opening hymn. God's love is extravagant for God has given us the gift of Christ Jesus. Through Jesus, God pours out love as a cleansing lotion for our weary souls. God's love is healing. God's healing balm soothes and comforts us. God's love is generous. God continually reaches out for us and helps us throughout all our lives. Thanks be to God for such extravagant healing and generous love.
Let us pray. Holy God, pour out your holiness on us. Pour out your strength that we may worship you with the confidence of beloved children. Pour out your grace that we may enter your presence fully and completely, loving you with our tears, our prayers, and our praise. In love and gratitude we pray. Amen. Amen. During this very difficult time, it is important that we remind ourselves and one another that we are not alone and that God is with us. The Statement of Faith of the United Church of Canada just does just that. Let us recite these reassuring words together. For no matter what, God will never, ever leave us. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God, who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Holy Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope, in life, in death, in life beyond death. God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Hi, boys and girls. Um, we have been learning about how we are encountering Jesus throughout Lent. And in our scripture today, a woman basically crashes a party in order to spend time with Jesus. And so she was willing to do anything just to be with him. And I wondered what that might look like for us. So let's try something. While you're sitting there, close your eyes for a minute and think about these questions, okay? Close your eyes. If you could meet Jesus anywhere, where would you choose to meet him? What would you want Jesus to say to you? What would you be doing? And what would you say to Jesus? You can open your eyes. Sometimes for me, I picture Jesus standing in front of me with his hands on my face. And that way he has my full attention. Um, boys and girls, you can encounter Jesus wherever you are and whenever you want. So don't forget that. Remember that Jesus loves you and you are a blessing. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for being right here with us. And Help us to look for ways to encounter you throughout Lent. In Jesus' name, amen.
I know that Pastor Jim has been ordained by God and lavishly anointed to proclaim God's holy word to each of us. As we anticipate a holy encounter, we must first let go of the things that keep us from truly hearing what God has in store for us as we worship. Therefore, let us offer our confession. Let us pray. Welcome us, gracious God, as Jesus welcomes sinners and saints alike. Forgive the wrongs we have done and the acts of mercy we have left undone. Bless us with your mercy and grace, especially when we feel friendless and beaten down. Reassure us of your love, especially when we feel most alone and most undeserving. Welcome us into your holy presence with forgiving grace and faithful love that never ends. Just like the woman who knelt at Jesus' feet with tears flowing, we too must offer our private confession to God and God alone. In the sacred space, in this sacred time, let us do just that. Sisters and brothers, Jesus said to the woman with the alabaster jar, Your sins are forgiven. Hear his words for yourselves and take them into your heart and soul. Glory to God. Amen.
This morning, as we come to a time of prayer, we wanted to take an opportunity to pray together. We wanted to take an opportunity to, uh, to respond uh, liturgically, um, but uh, as a family, through this, uh, this season of pandemic that we are experiencing. And so you'll be invited to follow along with me in this responsive prayer. And my hope and prayer as we share in these words together, that truly our hearts would continue to be one and that we would uh, see God in this moment, in this moment of crisis and fear and worry for so many people. And so I invite you this morning, beloved of God, let us pray together. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. May we, who are merely inconvenienced, remember whose lives are at stake. May we who have no risk factors remember those most vulnerable. May we who have the luxury of working from home remember those who must choose between preserving their health or making their rent. May we who have the flexibility to care for our children when their schools close Remember those who have no options. May we who have to cancel our trips remember, remember those who have no safe place to go. May we who are losing our margin money in the tumult of, economic, of the economic market remember, remember those who have no margin at all. May we who settle in for a quarantine at home Remember those who have no home. As fear grips our country, let, let us choose love. During this time when we cannot physically wrap our arms around each other, let, let us yet find ways to be the loving embrace of God to our neighbors. Amen. As we continue our time of prayer this morning, uh, we've been asking and inviting you all to share glory sightings, to share prayer requests with us. I'm so thankful that many of you have taken us up on these opportunities. We have received a, a bunch of emails and Facebook messages and phone calls and even a few text messages of prayer that uh, invite us to continue to be this family together as we pray. I want to share just a couple of the glory sightings that we have received just in the last few days with us. Uh, we heard from, uh, from the Beck family that Anne and Emily have decided to take this time to begin a kind of a family household newspaper. And they're seeing great joy in this opportunity to share news with one another. Uh, we're also celebrating with Julie, her parents. Uh, their church celebrated their 200th anniversary uh, just in this last week, and had a great uh, barn celebration uh, as best they could in this uh, weird time as they celebrated. We're also celebrating our children's team and our staff for Christina and Sean, for those who have been uh, providing opportunities for our kids and families to continue to stay in worship, to learn, and to grow. 
Uh, I'm celebrating the rest of our staff, those who are helping us uh, be in these moments, who are working so diligently and so, so hard to make sure that we have these to share with one another. Um, talking about our neighbors, we've had several people share with me just this week about how they're having conversations, safe conversations, uh, with those who are around them and, and hearing each other's stories and waving and all of a sudden finding a little bit more closeness uh, with those who just live in, next door. We're seeing God uh, in, in community bear hunts. If you don't know what that is, look for those teddy bears in the windows of your neighborhoods. But also we're seeing God in chalk drawings on sidewalks as people go out and enjoy the beautiful weather that we've had the last several days. But as we celebrate these moments, we also are drawn to offer prayer requests, hope encounters where we're looking for God to be at work. We're continuing to pray for Dean and Ruth Midbow's daughter-in-law, Patty, who began uh, her treatment with chemo this week. She had a good week, but asks for continued prayer. Mary Davis Dickens called in this week and had some family friends uh, who passed away. And uh, she's sad, and those around them are sad. And so we would lift up encouragement. A friend of mine uh, this week, uh, Susie Nally, husband Joe, passed away uh, just a few days ago. We want to continue to pray for all of our health care workers, not just the ones who are part of our family, certainly those, but also those uh, who are giving of themselves over and over and over again uh, to put themselves in harm's way, uh, to help us flatten the curve quickly, to bring people back to health and wholeness. We do want to continue to lift up our leaders as well, our governor, um, our, our president, those around who are uh, doing the best they can with the information they've got. We want to lift them up unto the Lord. I know there's a bunch of others who want to continue to invite you to share those prayer requests with us. As, uh, as we continue to pray throughout here as your staff, we share those with our prayer team. Let us know so we can be praying together. At this time, I invite you, let's pray. Let's offer our hearts to God. And uh, let's meet God in this moment. Gracious and loving God, we are amazed at the opportunity to meet with you in such a different way. Lord, there's not very many of us who ever planned that we would be having a, a worship service while staring at a screen today. I know I certainly never thought that I would be preaching to a camera. And yet, Lord, here we are in a time of uncertainty, in a time of not knowing, in a time of a lot of questions. And it seems like very few answers. And Lord, we are reminded that as we think about all of these things, you're still Lord of all. You're still Lord of all. Lord, that, that's a word of hope that we need to hear this morning. We need to to have that hope um, infused into who we are. Lord, we want to be carriers of that hope into a world that is stuck, to our neighborhoods where there is fear, where our family and friends and we're distant, where we can't touch and be with those that we love, where we can't gather on a Sunday morning in a place where many of us have gathered for years. Lord, we, we need that hope. And so, Lord, this morning we ask that you would come and you would anoint us, your people, wherever we are, however we are tuning in this morning to be together, we ask that you would anoint us in your grace and your love and your mercy and with hope. Lord, we thank you for the ways in which you are moving. We want to see more of it, God. So continue to move and continue to use us, hands and feet of the body of Christ. Lord, thank you for this time of worship. Use it. Draw us all closer to your heart. So much so that when we sign off later this morning, each and every one of us will know wherever we are that we have spent time on holy ground. That we have been able to encounter you. Lord, we pray all of this in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus, our King, our Master, the one who has no fear. And we do so joining together our voices now 
praying as he taught us so long ago, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture passage this morning comes to us from Luke's Gospel, the seventh chapter, verses 36 through 50. We're spending time this Lent, Lenten season in this Gospel, uh, looking for ways in which Jesus has encountered those around him, and then how we, uh, hopefully, can encounter him. So I invite you this morning, let's listen to this familiar passage, uh, and I invite you also, let's use our uh, imagination caps. Put those on as we listen, as we hear. Luke chapter 7, verses 36 through 50. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to have dinner with him. So Jesus went to his home and sat down to eat. When a certain immoral woman from the city heard he was eating there, she brought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfume. Then she knelt behind him at his feet, weeping. Her tears fell on his feet, and she wiped them off with her hair. Then she kept kissing his feet and putting perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. She's a sinner. Then Jesus answered his thoughts. Simon, he said to the Pharisee, I have something to say to you. Go ahead, teacher, Simon replied. Then Jesus told him this story. A man loaned money to two people, 500 pieces of silver to one and 50 pieces to the other. But neither of them could repay him, so he kindly forgave them both, canceling their debts. Who do you suppose loved him more after that? Simon answered, I suppose the one for whom he canceled the larger debt. That's right, Jesus said. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, Look at this woman kneeling here. When I entered your home, you didn't offer me water to wash the dust from my feet, but she has washed them with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't greet me with a kiss, but from the time I first came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You neglected the courtesy of olive oil to anoint my head, but she has anointed my feet with a rare perfume. I tell you, her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven. So she has shown me much love. But a person who is forgiven little shows only little love. Then Jesus said to the woman, your sins are forgiven. The men at the table said among themselves, who is this man? And he goes around forgiving sins. And Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I have to tell you, I absolutely love this passage. It just, it crashes my soul and it grabs my imagination. Like when, when I was a kid and all of my make-believe stories came true on the playground. The swing set in my backyard became a castle and aircraft carrier or a mountain, a hideout. The grapefruit tree in the back corner of that yard, it wasn't just for fruit. It was where Robin Hood and Little John planned their next attack on the rotten sheriff of Nottingham, where elves and dwarves hid from orcs and evil kings. So my grandmother was a kindergarten teacher, and she would let me be her teacher's assistant whenever school was off. She would uh, sit with her kids and she would introduce new letters and I'd watch the kids go wide-eyed as a new inflatable person was revealed. She'd say things like, let's put our imagination caps on. 
And then they would transport into the world of Mr. T T T Tall Teeth T or Miss A A A Chu A. Putting on my cap, never a problem. The passage that we read a second ago is one that begs us to use our imagination. It calls us to leave behind adulthood and the boring worries that seem to increase as, well, at least as I get older. It wants to be seen, it, not just read. It's a, it's a story about a good guy, a bad girl, a hero, and a switch that nobody saw coming. Before we get to that story, though, I want to explore some of the people of Jesus' day. It can be really easy to look at the Bible and forget that there were real people involved here. People that weren't that much different than, than we are. They, they didn't have the technology and the resources that we do. But they struggled. They had questions. They had fears, just like we do. A pandemic like what we're facing now was a real threat. There were laws across the empire that had been passed to isolate people who could be carrying a disease or a sickness to someone else. We still in a, live in a world where there are those who, who have and those who have not. We label as poor or middle or rich, and those are oftentimes way too simplistic. In Jesus' day, there were as many as seven different groupings or classes of people, ranging from the elite, the rulers, to those who were isolated and forgotten. Where you were on this list determined what power and what control you had. The class system in Israel was as much religious as it was anything. On one extreme, you'd have those, the Essenes and the Zealots, groups who wanted complete separation from the secular world. The, the Essenes would leave their cities and they would dedicate their lives to a program of holiness one that said, the holier I am, the more quickly God is going to come and deal with the pagans and the sin in the world. The zealots, on the other hand, they weren't as interested in a, a holiness regime. They wanted to get rid of pagan influence, and they would fight to do so. One group, the Sicarii, or the dagger men, were particularly good at sneaking up behind Roman soldiers and assassinating them in large crowds as an attempt to spur revolution to pursue their freedom. Well, on the other side of the spectrum were the, the Roman sympathizers and the Sadducees, the supporters of Rome, often called Herodians in scriptures. They didn't care much about the religious system at all. In fact, they just wanted the comforts of being a Roman people. The Sadducees, they were responsible for the temple and the sacrifices and, and really the leading of the Hebrew people. Religious, yes, but they were just as interested in maintaining that power and that control. They would blend um, political flavors and favors with religious experience, all for the sake of their own benefit. And in the middle of these four different groups were the Pharisees. The Pharisees, they had no political power, but they had a whole lot of influence on the common folk. They believed deeply in ritual and, and everyday holiness. They were devout. They were rule followers. They loved God, and they were intent in keeping as many of the laws of God as possible, oftentimes to their own detriment. They could get so caught up in one small little matter that they would forget the larger elements of their faith story. Not a single one of these groups, Essenes, Zealots, Pharisees, Sadducees, or Herodians, cooperated on anything. They fussed, and they fussed and they fought over everything. And to be a part of any of these groups was to be called and included and thus to reject everybody else. There was one other group, the commoners, folks who just were trying to be faithful, folks just trying to make it, often couldn't endure because of these incredible extremes all around them. And it's into this constant infighting and power-grabbing mess that God gives the world Jesus. 
The Pharisees and Sadducees, they rarely agreed on anything. The Zealots and the Essenes both wanted freedom from Rome, but couldn't agree on how. And the Roman sympathizers couldn't agree with any of it. In the first century, your enemy was your enemy. And common ground, well, that was passed over for the sake of power and influence. It's part of the reason that the story of Jesus is so incredibly intriguing. Looking over the gospel stories, the authors are so very clear that all of these different groups wanted to be with Jesus. There were Roman soldiers who sought Jesus out. Herod feared Jesus, but was also fascinated by him. It's possible that John the Baptist was part of an Essene community and that Jesus had been influenced by both of them. Two of Jesus' disciples were Zealot. Simon, his nickname was Zealot, and Judas Iscariot. Some folks even think that Iscariot is another way of saying a Sicari, one of the dagger men. The Sadducees, they, many of them wanted to be around Jesus too. Old Nicodemus, he was on the ruling council. And as we just read, the Pharisees invited him to dinner. In the end, all of these groups would also play a big role in the death of Jesus. They sought him. They wanted him to be their friend. But since he wouldn't choose a side, they all declared him dangerous and worthy of death. They all agreed that Jesus wasn't for them. His message of radical, life-changing love for everybody was just too much. His call to repentance and holiness and living a life of grace was beyond their very narrow approach to the world. Oh, and let's not forget, embracing Jesus also forced them to give up their power. The amazing thing is Jesus' friends with all these other groups, Jesus' friends may have been his biggest struggle. His friends, the nobodies, the unreliable, and they come off as very annoying. They shoot their mouths off. They run when the fire gets hot. They they doubt like crazy. Some of them want to call down fire on one group. Others want to leave a bunch of people in the wilderness so they can go on a boat ride. They dismiss children from coming close to the master His closest friends, these 12, were a bunch of not good enough common folk, and his best supporters were a handful of women who the rest of the world saw as second-class people. The largest group of people that gathered around Jesus were the dregs of the society, lepers, the blind, the demon-possessed, the impure woman with the bleeding issue, the lame, the needy. They were always around him. And he not only spoke healing and wholeness into their lives, but he would touch them and he would restore them to the very community that was so afraid of these people. He regularly contaminated himself with their impurity, with the impurity all around him. And as he did, he transformed each life with a a blinding kind of love that continues to astonish and amaze us even today. It's into this world and these people groups that this story that we read takes place. There's a good guy, this Pharisee, who's invited Jesus to an after-Sabbath meal. Now, to dine with someone is a a big sign of respect. It's a relationship offering. For a well-respected, holy Pharisee to have Jesus in his house is a big deal. It was also a a spectacle spectacle that, that had to be witnessed. When we have dinner parties, we only want the folks who are invited. Party crashers are not cool. But dinner parties around Jesus were really different. There were always party crashers. In fact, hosts would set up their dinners in courtyards where the guests would recline uh, around the table while crowds were allowed to surround the outside, to be a part, sometimes to beg for food or just to be around the important people. One of those people standing around the table is a woman that the Bible calls immoral. Now, that's Bible speak for prostitute. Now, this is interesting because this Pharisee, Simon, he obviously knows who she is and what she does. And because of the social structure thing, a Pharisee, he could open his home to beggars and others wanting to witness the special guest. 
but never to an immoral woman. Of course, she probably wouldn't have wanted to be in a Pharisee's house anyway, and yet here she is. And what she does is scandalous beyond words. The table is U-shaped, so you don't sit at it. You recline with your feet pointing away from the food. You'd lean on your left arm and you would eat with your right. This woman, in the middle of the meal, leans down to Jesus' bare feet and she begins to weep, her tears flowing. She has a jar of perfume and she begins to pour it out on him. She has no towel, so she lets down her hair, something that only a married woman would do in the privacy of her own home. And she uses her hair to dry his feet. Have you ever been in a space and things got weird and you didn't know what to say or do next? This is that moment. But Simon, he knows exactly what to do. He knows what he would do. He knows who this woman is and her behavior that's so scandalous, and it just shows what kind of person that Jesus is. All the rumors that he had heard about Jesus are coming true. Simon had opened his door out of respect to a man who was a friend of tax collectors and sinners and prostitutes. He was a glutton and a drunk one that the other Pharisees had warned him about. And so Simon makes a judgment, and the awkwardness deepens. And then Jesus takes that awkwardness, and he just kind of pokes it a little bit. Simon, who do you suppose is more grateful? Someone who is forgiven a a huge, unpayable debt, or someone who owes a few bucks? Is the person about to be tortured until they can pay back what's been borrowed happier with their freedom? Or the person who could pay back his debtors with what's found in the glove compartment of their parked camel outside? Well, the answer is obvious, isn't it? Uh, Owing a few dollars isn't nearly as bothersome as owing thousands. And Jesus says... This woman, this immoral, unwanted, impure woman is only responding to the forgiveness from her huge debt. This woman lavishly responds to Jesus. Simon invited, to, invited Jesus to dinner. It's a nice gesture, but really Simon has a motive. It wasn't for respect, it was to test. To be welcomed in a home included being anointed and greeted and refreshed, and Simon offers none of it. It's a power play for a purpose of figuring out who Jesus was. This woman, in her impurity, can't tolerate the disrespect. She, the the villain of the story, has this, this moment, this awareness that is awakened in her in the slumber of her sin, and she responds. And the villain, the enemy, becomes the heroine. The hero, the good guy, the holy Pharisee is revealed as a self-righteous villain. The self-righteous villain that he truly is at heart. I learn a lot about Jesus' friends and enemies here. The enemies of Jesus have, they have traits that are, that are very definable. I'm not a list guy, But in this case, I made one. Jesus' enemies, the folks who set themselves up against or as better than Jesus, have these kind of traits. They're they're self-righteous. They're bitter. They're resentful. They're indignant. They're hoarders of holiness. And they forget the needs of others. They want power. And they're afraid of losing what control they think they have. They have all of their answers, and you know what? That's really all that matters. But the friends of Jesus, they also have a list of behaviors and traits. These are people who Jesus gravitates to. He calls them into a deeper life. His friends are annoyingly unreliable, and they know it. His friends have experienced forgiveness, and they are repentant people. They lavishly worship. They pour out not just financial resources, but they pour out time and talents and their very selves to make sure that Jesus is honored. The friends of Jesus may mess up, 
But for them, holiness isn't a checklist. It's an experience, a way of life. The friends of Jesus live with their eyes wide open to those in need. They live fearless in the face of corrupt power keepers. Jesus' friends were set out and empowered to be like him, to pray that his kingdom would interrupt the broken kingdoms of this earth. I came home one day this week, and Joy, and, uh, Joy had Oliver on, on her lap, and they were watching something. And since everything is closed down, we found out that Disney has now video clips of all of their rides at their parks. And so I sat down on the couch, and as I did, I heard a familiar tune that once it's sung, it's sung and it's in your head, it won't go away. It's a small world after all. It's a small world after all. It's a small world after all. It's a small, small world. You're welcome. Did you know that that song was written for the World Fair? The Pepsi company wanted an exhibit that showed all the nations of the world, and they planned that each nation's anthem would be played as folks journeyed through the many lands around the globe. The problem is that, that many songs and melodies and words, they create an absolute mess. You couldn't make sense out of the madness, so Disney was brought in to bring some clarity. And they came up with this song that repeats and never ends and has this one melody, and the rest, the rest is history. This week, I saw folks post the, the We Are the World video from the 80s. Do you remember that one? I watched as these privileged artists gathered and as a huge choir, and they sang the same words over and over again. As I watched, I saw some folks crying, many of them just smiling, beaming uncontrollably. A few of them had their hands in the air, almost as praise. It was one melody uniting one very different group of people in unison. And it dawned on me as I watched this, I want to be a part of a church that's singing one song. One song that bridges our divides, not a thousand songs that's really just a loud racket of unrelated words and melodies. I want to be a part of a church where Jesus is lavishly worshipped where my self-righteousness, it's allowed to, to step aside and I'm still invited to the table. I want to be a friend of Jesus and I want to be a friend who lives differently because I know that I have been forgiven much. There have been a lot of calls this week for prayers from the, for the church of Jesus, calls to pray in unity the Lord's Prayer at a certain time, calls to ring our church bells, calls to join in fasting and praying for healing. I'm going to tell you, I'm in for all of them. But I'm also praying that this is going to be a time when the church might begin to sing with one voice the song of Jesus again. That we might reject our own self-righteousness and our bitter and our anger at those who are different from us. That we might humble ourselves and realize just how much we've been forgiven. That we might reject polarizing classes and choose to lavishly respond to his love. I'm praying for, for the healing and an end to this pandemic, but I'm also praying for a repentant revival to sweep our church. I'm praying we won't be worried about the little groups that we come from, but we'll be more concerned with responding at the feet of Jesus. I'm praying that the church of Jesus will be a whole lot more than just a social dinner party, but we will be a body of folks consumed with God's beauty, goodness, and truth. I'm praying that we're going to encounter him and we'll be empowered by him to be part of the healing of this small, small world. I guess the question for us this morning is, what do you want from your church? What do you want our dinner party to look like? In the season of shutdown, with so much downtime, why not take some time and be still and see what kind of friend 
you and I are. Are are we making a lot of noise with our ideas and our rightness? Or are we singing a song that the rest of the world is longing to hear? Brother and sister, you and I have been invited to be his friend. You, by the power of the Spirit of the living God, are called to be a part of the beautiful, scandalous kingdom. So, lavishly worship this week. Pray to be empowered by the anointing and healing of Jesus. And let's make that manifest to those around us. I invite you to pray with me. Lord, we thank you for this story. And we thank you for the opportunity to enter into it with our imagination. We thank you that you've showed us what a friend looks like. And we ask, Lord, in these days of, uh, again, so much uncertainty and questions, that we, well, we would find ways to be your friend. Lord, if that's a a need for repentance on our part, Lord, help us quickly get there and help us also to remember whenever there's repentance, there's a big giant party afterwards. Lord, where we've we've settled in to a routine or a way of things that have to be, shake us up. Help us see. Help us realize that the, the borders, the walls of your body wow, they are probably a whole lot wider than what we think. Holy Spirit, fall fresh on us, your kids. Empower us, equip us, and let us show your love to the world. We pray all of this in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, amen. As we respond to the word this morning, uh, we continue to give of our offerings, our tithes, that which belongs to God. I want to say thank you to those of you who've continued to support and to, uh, to send in uh, those gifts to the church. Um, we really appreciate it. Uh, on the bottom of your screen here in just a minute, there's going to be that link. You can go to the website. You can continue to give. There's also going to be an opportunity uh, this afternoon from 1 till 3 where a couple of us are going to be standing just outside here at the church with a bucket that if you want to drop your offering off, you can. But I invite you, wherever you are, let's respond to the Lord this morning as Bob sings and as we continue in worship. One day a plain village woman driven by love for her lord recklessly poured out a valuable essence disregarding the scorn And once it was broken and spilled out Of fragrance filled all the room Like a prisoner set free from his shackles Like a spirit set free from the tomb Broken and spilled out Just for love of you, Jesus My own precious treasure Lavished on thee Broken and spilled out And poured at your feet In sweet 
feet abandon, let me be spilled out and used up for thee. Lord, you were God's precious treasure, his love and his own perfect son, sent here to show me the love of the Father. Just for love it was done. And though you were perfect and holy, you gave up yourself willingly, and you spared no expense for my pardon. You were used up and wasted for me broken and spilled out just for love of you, Jesus, my own precious treasure lavished on thee. Broken and spilled out and poured at your feet in sweet abandon. Let me be spilled out and used up for thee. Gracious God, we give you thanks for the opportunity to give these tithes and offerings, however we may be doing so. We ask that you would use them for the sake of your kingdom, that someone this week, well, they might know the lavish love of God because of our faithfulness this morning. We love you, Lord, and we offer these to you um, as a, a gift of love ourselves. We honor you, we praise you, and we give you thanks. For it is in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We're so thankful that you uh, joined us this morning. And so as we continue, as we, or as we close this time of worship, uh, we do so with the singing of our closing, our closing hymn. It's number 399 in your hymns. Obviously, the words will be on the screen for you. So I invite you wherever you are. Let's stand up and let's sing together. Take my life and let it be.
this morning. Um, we uh, are so thankful to be able to share in this way. We want to again say thank you to all who have made it possible for the team that's behind the cameras, for the team that's behind me. Uh, we want to thank our, our special guest pianist and accompanist this morning, uh, Janelle Hamilton, for jumping in and being with us today. Uh, we are very thankful. Friends, as you go into this week, uh, may you find opportunities to relish in the lavish love of God. And as you relish in that love, may you find opportunities to lavishly worship back. Go and be a friend this week. As you do, may the love of the Father, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the power of Holy Spirit be in you, go with you, and be shared with whoever you meet this week. And until we come together again, friends, grace and peace. Grace and peace.